Hello, I'm Mario Suarez. Today is a very special day for all of us at Homework Hotline. Seven years ago today, we broadcast our first Homework Hotline from this set, which is now an office area. Here's the original logo and sign. During our show today, we're going to look back at the last seven years, including some never-before-seen screen tests and bloopers. Come with me now. It was on a Monday afternoon seven years ago that Homework Hotline first came on the air. Since then, our program has received statewide recognition, national renown, worldwide attention, and an Emmy. And it would not have been possible without you, students and callers. And now to start our eighth season. This is Homework Hotline. If you are a junior high student in the Los Angeles Unified School District, this is your chance to get help in math and English. Call us now at area code 213-625-5358. Teachers are waiting for your questions and will answer them for you. So give us a call on Homework Hotline. Hi, welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Hall Davidson, and this is my teaching partner, Irene Masuyama. Homework Hotline may help you. Well, I'm sitting in the classroom, it's a quarter to two. Hello and welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Robert Vriesman and today, as Mario mentioned, is a special day. It's our seventh anniversary. As always on Homework Hotline, we're here to answer your questions in both math and English. And today, I'll be covering some, some factoring and some complex fractions. But before I begin, I'd like to share a short clip with you. In 1983, six months before Homework Hotline began, a pilot show was created. The producer of this show, this never-before broadcast pilot, Roger Nipp, put together a vision of what a homework hotline type show would look like. He called it Homework Assistance. Take a look and see just how close his pilot was to our show of today. Okay, so we're ready when you are. Our phone number here is 625-6960, and we're here to help you. Let's take our first call. Hi, um, I'm having a little trouble with my English homework. I still don't understand the difference between an indirect and a direct object. Could you explain that, please? Well, Larry, this is right up your alley. Sure. Why don't you, uh... sure. Live television teaching can be interactive, just as in the classroom. Specific homework problems could be delivered to the teachers by telephone before the program, or conversations with students could be broadcast live as the tutor the attempts to explain the solution. The action of this verb. In other words, the subject does this to this. I, yeah, I understand that part. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, I would like to get into some problems that uh, have to do with two, 
two linear equations. And one way we're going to solve it by using the substitution method, and the other way by the elimination method. And to help me today solving these problems was the person that called him in. Are you there, Mike? Yes, I am. Well, good. Uh, can you see the board all right over here? Yes. OK. Then uh, this first one, Mike, we're going to solve it by substitution. But before we can begin working it out, we have to do something first. And what is that, Mike? Um, you have to. I really don't know. OK, we have to solve this first equation here for p. So I'm going to rewrite this equation off to the side so we can see what's going on. p minus 5q equals 6. OK? And what I want this to say is I want it to say p equals. So can you help me solve this equation so it'll say p equals, Mike? Um, p equals 5q plus 6. Well, what I'm going to do is add 5q to this side and then 5q to this side. See what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Ah, OK. So then here I'm going to have p equals, and over on this side I'm going to have 5q plus 6. You follow? Yes. OK, great. Now I'm going to use this equation right here, but I'm not going to write the p. I'm going to leave the p out because I'm going to substitute in for that p. So I'm going to write 3, and then I'm going to write a set of parentheses there. So you see what I did? Instead of writing this p, I put a set of parentheses. OK. OK. Minus 2q equals 5. All right? So this is the same equation right here, Mike, but I left a set of parentheses where that p is. And now I'm going to fill in. What did we come up with our p being over here? What shall I put right here? 5q plus 6. 5q plus 6. Now, can you, can you multiply that through for me? Um, it's 15q. Good. Plus um, 18. 3 times 6? 18. 18. OK. Can you speak up just a little bit, Mike? I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Sure. OK. And then what's after that? Minus 2q. Minus 2q. Equals 5. Equals 5. OK, good. Now what? Um, you add 15q and 2q. OK. We don't add it. We oh, subtract. Subtract. OK, so now we have 13q plus 18 yeah. equals 5. Now what? Uh, you, have to add the, you have to subtract the 18 from Subtract 18 from both sides, OK? So we have 13q equals 22. Ah, uh, careful. Oh, um, negative 13. Very good. OK, there you go. Now what do we do? Um, you um, find out how many 13qs could go into 13. Right. So this just cancels out, right? Yes. And so q is going to equal? 1. Careful. Negative 1. Negative 1, OK. Now, are we done? Yes. No, we're not. We're not done. No, we're not done. That's halfway through the problem. We found out what q equals, but now we have to stick it back into one of these equations over here to solve for the p. OK? So we can use this equation right over here, because we already we changed that equation around. So all we have to do is stick in this q, which we found it to be negative 1. We have to stick it right in there. So let's rewrite this equation, p equals Five. And here, I'm going to leave a little parentheses right there, plus 6. Now, what did our q equal? Negative 1. Negative 1. So let's plug that negative 1 right in there. Now, p equals negative 1 times 5? Um, negative 5. Negative 5 plus 6. So p is going to equal? Um, 1. 1. Good. Now, if we write that as an ordered pair, if we write that as an ordered pair, we would have to put the p first. Because when it's not x and y, we just go alphabetically. OK. OK? And so we're going to put the 1 right there and the negative 1 right there. OK. Now, Mike, I want to remind you that when we do this, that these are two linear equations. In other words, if we graph them, we would f what we're actually finding here is where those two lines cross. This solution is the point where those two lines cross. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. OK, good. OK. So now, let's go over to this other one that you gave me yesterday. And let's solve this one using the elimination method. All right. OK. So when we eliminate, rather than solve it for an x, we just add those two equations together, right? Yeah. OK. So what would we get here? Um, 2x. 2x. And then the y, oops, 2x. 2x. 
You said 2x and I still wrote a y. The y's just cancel themselves out, right? Yes. All right. Equals what? 12. 12, good. OK, this is not a tough one at all, is it? No. Now what do we do? Um, you, um, 2x into 12. OK. We are divide both sides by 2. Yes. OK. 2's cancel out here, so x equals? 6. 6. Are we done? No. No, good, good. Now we have to stick that 6. Does it matter which one of these equations we stick that 6 into? Um, no. No, it doesn't. OK. Let's stick it, stick it in that first one, though. We're a set of parentheses for the x plus y equals 2, and we know that 6 goes right there. Now what would we do? Um, find the value of y. Say it again. Find the value of y. Find the value of y. Very good. So to do that, we need to subtract 6 from both sides. So y is going to equal? Negative 4. Negative 4. OK, very good. So again, if we wrote that, wrote that as an ordered pair, we would put the 6 right here and the negative 4 right there. And again, I want to remind you that we had two linear equations. If we graph them, what we found right there, without even graphing them, is the point where those two lines would cross. Mike, you were terrific. Thank you. Thanks a lot for calling in on our seventh anniversary show. Thank you. Keep calling in. All right. Thanks a lot. You bet you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's go over here. I have a couple more kind, kind of factoring problems, but these are, are, are interesting in that they are purposely set up to give you practicing in canceling the numerator and the denominator. But before we do that, in one case we have to factor the numerator, and in the other case we have to factor the denominator. So. I want to thank Danny, an eighth grader at Dodson, for calling in this problem right here. So the numerator, we're just going to rewrite. And the denominator, we're going to factor. We look to see what, what factors those two terms on the bottom have in common. And they both have a 4 in common and a p in common. So if I factor those, those, two, those two factors out, I'm going to get a p right here minus a 2 right there. So now I look above and see if what I can cancel right here. This 4 will cancel with this 4. This p right here will cancel with one of these p's, so there's a, a p squared left over. So what I have here is p squared all over p minus 2. I can't factor it anymore, so that's my answer in this case right there. OK, this one is a, a very similar type problem, but in this case I just have to factor the numerator. So there's a 4 in common. Remember that 12 is 3 times 4. So I'm going to factor out that 4, and I get n plus 3. And then in the denominator, I also have an n plus 3. So in this case, that aspect of the fraction cancels out, and the answer is 4. So you can see how these, these problems are similar. And we have, to, we have to look to see whether we can factor in the numerator or denominator. In some cases, we have to factor both. And then we cancel. And uh, now I'm going to use, do a similar type of problem. First, I want to give myself a little more room. OK. In this problem right here, it was called in by Jenny, she, who is a 10th grader at Fullerton High School. We have x plus 1 all over x minus 2. And that equals x plus 3 all over x plus 1. Now, what I have here is a proportion, which usually we just deal with one factor. But in this case, we have binomials in both the numerator and denominator of both of these fractions. But I do it the same way. I'm going to do some cross multiplication here. And so I'm going to rewrite it first so that it's easy to see. x plus 1 times x plus 1. And that's going to equal, I can multiply this way, x plus, I can either put the minus 2 or plus 3, since multiplication is commutative, times x minus 2. OK, now we can multiply that out, and we can see what we get. We multiply this term times this term. We're just using a couple applications of the distributive property. And we have x squared plus x, x times x, x times 1. Now 1 times x is plus another x, and then plus 1. And then on the other side, that equals x squared. x times negative 2 is minus 2x. 3 times x is plus 3x. And 3 times negative 2 is minus 6. Now I'm going to combine that middle term. I hope that all fits on your television screen there. x squared plus
plus 2x plus 1 is going to equal x squared plus x minus 6. Minus 2x plus 3x gives me 1x. I don't need to write that 1. And now, even though it still looks a, a little complicated, you'll see in this next step, Next step here, a lot, of, a lot of the factor, a lot of the terms rather, are just going to disappear. So if I subtract an x squared from this side and from this side, okay, I'll rewrite that so you can see what we're left with. 2x plus 1 equals x minus 6. Okay? And I might do a couple things in that step if, if I've done a lot of these, but when I first start out, or if, or if you haven't seen it before, I'm going to take a couple steps to do it just so it's clear what's happening here. Now I'm going to subtract an x, and like I say, I could have done that all in one step, but I want you to be sure what's going on, be sure that you can see that you can, what is actually going on. So I subtracted an x from both sides, 2x minus x is x plus 1 equals 6, negative 6. Now I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides, so x is going to equal negative 7. So I could stick that back in up there. In fact, let's do that because that will be an interesting check. Okay, so x is now negative 7. So I'm going to go negative 7 plus 1 all over negative 7 minus 2. And that's going to equal negative 7 plus 3 all over negative 7 plus 1. Negative 7 plus 1, negative 6 all over negative 7 minus 2, negative 9 equals negative 7 plus 3 negative 4, negative 7 uh, plus 1, negative 6. Now we cross multiply here. Negative 6 times negative 6 36. Negative 9 times negative 4 36. So our proportion checks. That's a nice kind of a problem. It looks complicated at first and then it boils down to a, a, a nice answer. So a lot of times you just keep going and do what it is that you think you're supposed to do and you're going to come up with an answer. Now there's a couple fractions that I wanted to cover that I didn't get to yesterday. And so I, ha I have an opportunity to do them today. And what I want to do is I have 7 and a half, and I want to divide that by another mixed number. Let's say it's 3 and 2 thirds. All right? Now the first thing that I have to do in a problem like this is change those mixed fractions into improper fractions. And I do that by multiplying 2 times 7 is 14 plus 1 is 15 halves divided by 3 times 3 is 9 plus 2 is 11 thirds. So that, that's my first step. Now I'm going to rewrite that and I'm going to invert and multiply or multiply by the reciprocal 15 halves times 3 over 11. I look to see if I can cancel but in this case I can't because three of my corners there are prime numbers so I just multiply across and I have 45 over 22. So it's not a real nice answer. And I can divide that out and see what I get. And in which case, I always remember that this line means divided by. And so if you can see it right away, you can write it out. Or if you can't see it, you just divide that 45 by 22. It goes in there two times. It's 44. And I get 2 and 1 over 22. So that would be my answer right there. A nice predominance of 2's there. OK, let's come over here. And in this case, I, wanna, I have a whole number, 8, minus a mixed number, say 1 and 2 sevenths. So this seems to be a difficulty for a lot of 7th or even some 8th grade students. And that is what to do with that, with that fraction on the bottom. OK? Well, I'm rewriting it this way so we can see that we need a fraction right there. If we don't have a fraction, we go to our next door neighbor there, the 8, and we, pick, we borrow a fraction from him. So we go over to there and we borrow a whole one from him. Then on the way home, we have to stop at the store and get change. In this case, that one that we borrow is going to equal 7 sevenths. Okay? How do I know it's going to be 7 sevenths? Well, I look at the denominator here. If I'm dealing with sevenths, that's the kind of change that I need. I need sevenths. Okay? So I put my 7 sevenths right over there. Now I can do my subtraction. 7 minus 2 is 5 sevenths. 7 minus 1 is 6. 6 and 5 sevenths. OK, so I had one division, one subtraction. And the other one that I had yesterday 
involved a multiplication, a, a similar type of thing, but it was a whole number. It was 12 times 3 and 7 eighths. I think that was it. So how am I going to multiply 12 times 3 and 7 eighths? Well, any time I have a whole number, I can always write it over 1 to change it into a fraction. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to write 12 over 1 times 3 times 8 is 24, plus 7 is 31, over 8. Now I look to see if I can cancel, and it doesn't, well, yes I can. 4 will go into here twice, 4 will go into here 3 times. So 3 times 31 is 93, 1 times 2 is 2, so again I can divide that 93 out, 93 divided by 2. If you can see it, that's fine. If you don't, then you just do a little bit more work like this. Goes in there six times, one left over, and so that's going to be 46 and a half. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for the math portion of our seventh anniversary show. Now please stay tuned. We have some more English coming right up. Thanks, Robert. I'm Deborah Gaines Matthews, and today I'll be answering questions on creative poetry writing with regards to spring. I've been a teacher on Hallmark Hotline for the last two years. When the series first began in 1984, Channel 58 held screen tests for teachers to be considered for the show. We found some of the tapes of those original screen tests, and we're going to, to look at them now. Here's a trivia question for you. See if you can tell how many of the teachers in the screen test tapes went on to actually become homework hotline teachers. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Mr. Davidson, and I'm going to be helping you with your math homework this afternoon. Now, I've got some questions uh, that have already been given to me, and we'll go to the board now and see what these are. The first one is on fractions. The question is, we're studying fractions, and I don't understand reciprocals. What's the reciprocal of 3 and 2 fifths? All right. Well, I have to tell you first that fractions are the hardest things you're going to study in math until you get to geometry. I'm going to get up to the board now and show you something about them. <clears throat> These are the questions that he asked about mean, median, and mode. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Stonehill, and this is English Hotline. Today we received a number of questions. One of them I thought was particularly interesting, and I thought it might help lots of you kids out there, is about a book report. A student called in and said that he's read a book, and, he's, and the book report is in one week, and he has to know how to write a book report. Writing is easy. It's not hard. As young people, you all loved writing in grades one, two, three. You went to school, glad, happy, little smiling faces. Somewhere along the line, grades four and five, somebody squashed you, stepped on you like a snail. Good afternoon, boys and girls. I'm Mrs. Susie So, a math teacher from Stephen White Junior High School, and I'm going to be your math teacher this afternoon. We have a question that some of you had phoned in, and the question is, uh, a boy said he didn't know his times tables, and he wondered if he would be successful in algebra. And the reciprocal simply is that number turned upside down. I know I did that kind of quickly, but I hope that that is clear, and I hope you will call in with more questions. I appreciate talking to you this evening. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening. <laughs> The answer is four. Yes, Hall, Mario, Ellen, and Ira Moscow, who taught on Homework Hotline in the first season. And now for my lesson today. As I said before, <clears throat> I'm going to be going over some different uh, strategies that you can use to write different creative uh, poems. Lisa and Barbara both called in with the same question. They're sixth graders at 59th Street School, and they've been given the task of writing a poem on the topic of spring. We know the spring is rapidly approaching, and uh, <clears throat> several students have been given this, this is homework assignment. Okay, now what I want to share with you, Lisa, Barbara, and anyone else with this particular question, is that <clears throat> there are 
many different ways that you can write a poem, not just the, um, the regular in rhyme kind of a, of a poem. One uh, type of poem that I want to share with you, it's so um, easy to write and it's very fun, particularly in reading, <clears throat> it's called a diamante poem or diamante poetry. Now as you can see, this kind of has uh, the lines that I've written all stand for places where words will actually be written for a diamante poem. Now part of the reason that we call this a diamante poem is because it actually has the shape of a diamond or it should look sort of like a diamond. Now let me go through very quickly and tell you what types of words go on each line. It's like formula poetry writing. That is we look at the formula, we plug in words that, that, that fit the formula and what we have is a diamante poem. Okay, first of all, on the first line, we always have a noun. And one thing that uh, Diamante poetry uh, is very good for is when you want to compare and contrast two things. Because we're going to see that the, uh, the noun that we put on the first line is actually going to be compared with this noun that we're going to put on the last line. Now, there are actually seven lines in the poem. Okay, so like I said, on the first line we have a noun. Okay, um, the second line, we have two adjectives two adjectives, and I'll just abbreviate, well, two adjectives. Both of these adjectives are going to describe this top noun. <clears throat> okay, the same thing is true down at the bottom. Remember this bottom noun is going to be compared. Sometimes it's the opposite of the first noun, but it's going to actually have some comparison with that top noun. But anyway, on the sixth line, we also have adjectives, and I'll just abbreviate that. Okay, and the two adjectives on the sixth line are going to describe the bottom, the bottom noun. Okay, now, on the third line and also on the, what is it, the sixth line, what we have is we have uh, participles. And I'll just abbreviate that also. Okay, we have participles, the verb forms ending in either ing or ed, and you'll see that in some of the examples that I'm going to go over. The same thing is true for the fifth line. We also want to designate that line for participles. Okay. Now, the fourth line is a very important line in the poem because this is where the shift or the change is actually made. Okay, on this line, on line four, all of the spaces are going to be reserved for nouns. But the first two nouns, the first two nouns are going to be nouns that are in some way related to this top, this top noun. Okay, and the, the second two nouns, you can look at them in pairs. The second two nouns, these two nouns are going to be related to the bottom noun. Okay, now one thing that I failed to mention with regards to the participles. Okay, the participles are going to in some way show action. These words, I'm sorry, the uh, participles are going to show action related to the, to, uh, to the top noun on line three, and uh, the participles down at the bottom are obviously going to show action related to this bottom noun. Now this looks really confusing, but it's really easy. Let me show you an example. And then we're going to take a look at the poem that Barbara and I actually uh, wrote on the phone, or we, we came up with on the phone. Okay, the top down. <clears throat> Notice that um, here we have Lakers, and down at the bottom we have raiders. These are the two nouns that we're going to in some way compare. Okay, Lakers and the raiders. Okay, now notice on line two, we have two adjectives. And these two adjectives are, like I said before, they're describing the top noun. Lakers, tall, athletic, okay? Now, on line three, remember we have three participles ending in either ing, verb forms ending in ing, or you can also have uh, verb forms ending in ed. But the point is, is that these three participles all must show action related to this top noun. Think of some of the action 
that the, perhaps the top, the top noun is involved in. Notice we have running, dribbling, shooting, okay? Now, on line four, remember, well, this is line three with the participles, then line four. Remember on line four, I said this is where the shift is made or the, the change. Okay, and I'll just draw a line here so that you can actually see. The, first of all, on line four, we have four nouns, okay? But remember, the first two nouns are related to the top noun. In contrast, the second two nouns, or the, the last two, two nouns on that line, are related to this bottom noun. This is where the change actually occurs, okay? Now we're talking, well, the first two nouns we're talking about the top noun. The second two nouns we're talking about the bottom. Notice what this poem reads, <clears throat> okay? It says magic and Kareem. Notice that uh, magic and Kareem, they're both nouns, they're proper nouns, but they're nouns still. And notice they are, in fact, Lakers. So they're nouns that are related to Lakers. Well, Kareem used to be a Laker. Okay, then the second two uh, nouns, Montana, Rice, nouns, proper nouns related to the Raiders. No, are they Raiders? Okay, I believe they're Raiders. Okay, well, they're football players. I, I believe they are Raiders. Someone gave me those names. Okay, um, now the next line, notice we have participles. Okay, um, passing, throwing, punting, these are action words related to the bottom noun. Football players, passing, throwing, punting. Okay, and then again, um, the sixth line, we have two adjectives, strong, power, powerful, raiders. Okay, so the poem should be read, Lakers, tall, athletic, running, dribbling, shooting, magic, Kareem. Montana, rice, passing, throwing, punting, strong, powerful, power, excuse me, powerful, raiders. Okay, and that would be the seventh line. Now, Barbara and Lisa, um, they needed to write a poem on spring. Notice that we can uh, compare spring and we can compare spring to one of the other seasons, winter. Okay, um, let's go through the poem that she and I um, wrote on the phone, or the, we went over on the, on the phone. Notice here, the top noun, we have spring, two adjectives that describe spring. Lisa said, uh, beautiful, colorful. Okay, in the next line, we have three participles showing action related to spring, blooming, blossoming, growing. Okay, and then notice on the fourth line, remember I said that was a very important line for a Diamante poem, and this is actually where the, where the change or the split is made. Okay, nouns related to, uh, the first two nouns related to the top noun, we have roses, tulips. Okay, then we have snow, sleet, both nouns related to the bottom, the bottom noun, winter. Okay, and um, then on the fifth line, we have three participles showing action related to the bottom noun, snowing, raining, hailing, gloomy, dreary, winter. Okay, so the poem should be read, spring, beautiful, colorful, blooming, blossoming, growing, roses, tulips, snow, sleet, snowing, raining, hailing, gloomy, dreary, winter. Okay, so... <clears throat> That's one type of creative poem that you can use to write your poem about spring. And how uh, interesting it would be to um, actually have a, a way of comparing it to another season. Um, perhaps you want to do winter the same way that Lisa and Barbara and I did. Okay, one other way <coughs> that I want to share with you is um, acrostic poetry. Acrostic poetry. Okay, and when we're writing acrostic poetry, what we do is we take the topic that we're writing about and um, we, we write it vertically on paper. And this is very different from an al alphabet poem where we say S is for spring and P is for this. Okay, it's not the same thing. Okay, in an acrostic poem, like I said, we write the topic, um, we write the topic down vertically um, in capital letters on paper. 
And what we do is we write sentences, each line actually contributing another detail to the poem. But one thing that you want to remember is that you can begin and end sentences anywhere. Okay, it's very different from an alphabet, alphabet poem. Let me share with you um, what, what I've written. Okay, very simply we have a spring. Okay, spring is a very precious time of year, time of the year. Okay, now notice with just this first sentence, notice that the first sentence ends on the second line. You can begin and end sentences anywhere. The only requirement is that when you come to the next line, the next line must begin with the next letter in the topic. Okay, so like I said, it's, it's very different from an alphabet uh, poem where you're saying what each letter stands for. Okay, um, okay, spring is a very special, I'm sorry, spring is a very precious time of the year. Um, okay, let me write the remainder. Okay, it is, and this would be a part of um, the line with the P, but since I don't have enough room, I'll just come over here. Um, it is time, it is the time, it is the time when roses are blooming. And everything And I think I'm going to read the remainder of this to you. Very simply, um, the acrostic poem reads, spring is a very precious time of the year. It is the time when roses are blooming and everything in nature looks naturally beautiful. It's a time to give thanks. Okay, notice, keep in mind that when you come to the next line, the only requirement is that you begin that line with the next letter um, in your subject. Well, we've gone over acrostic poetry and also diamante poetry. Try to use one of these types or one of these formulas to uh, write your poem about spring, Barbara and Lisa. Thank you so much. Uh, don't go away because coming up next, we have 15 additional minutes of English instruction from Mario. Thanks, Deborah. I'm Mario Suarez, and of course, it's our seventh anniversary show. Today, I'll be covering the limerick for Stephanie and then uh, conclude with signs and abbreviations for Celia. But first, I'd like to show you a short tape. Regular viewers know that most of our shows run very smoothly, right? With very few mistakes. Of course, there have been some bloopers over the last seven years, especially in the first season. Sometimes we forgot our phone number. Other times we were just having too much fun. But that first year was quite an experience. Here are some clips. Our Emmy, Emmy, excuse me, Emmy, Emmy nominated homework hotline show will be on in just a minute. Our lines are open, so give us a call at 1 800 LA Study. We're all set to help you with our your English and math homework, and we've got <laughs> some problems. Our phone number here at the studio is 1 800 LA Study or uh, you can dial the number simply by dialing 1-800 and the numbers that go with <laughs> L.A. study. Hi, I'm Ellen Stonehill. Homework Hotline will be on in just a minute. Our lines are now open, so phone us with, in with your English and math questions. Call us at 1-800 L.A. study. We're all set to help you with math and English. So now let's begin the show. It's time for me to wrap up math. But stay tuned for 30 minutes of English, and Steve and Ellen are waiting to teach you something. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> 12 into 21. How many times will that go? Uh, 12 times. One. Well, happy April Fools. <laughs> April Fools, Mrs. Stonehill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
to continue. Why did this happen to me? Why didn't this happen to one of the math people? But that's all I have, and I'd like to, uh, to donate the remainder of my time to a, a fine math teacher, in fact, the teacher of the year for Los Angeles City Schools, Mr. Ira Moscow. Thanks, Ira. Does well, that answer your question? That, that answers, and that's really interesting. I never knew a lot of this stuff, Thank which you. really goes to show you that whether you're a teacher or anybody, there's still plenty of stuff that you can learn. By the way, if you enjoyed watching Hall Davidson, you know, you can watch him on the mornings at, uh, from 7.30 to 8 o'clock on this same channel, channel 58, uh, doing more math. And it's, uh, so if you ever can't go to school someday or you're ill, turn on channel 58, watch Hall, then you'll probably really be ill. You dogs, you dogs, you dogs, dogs, dogs. Remember, you can call between 3.30 and 6 o'clock Monday through Thursday. The number is one 800 588 that's wrong. 1-800-LA-STUDY will be easier. I couldn't see it. We'll see you tomorrow at 4.30, and I'm Ellen Stonehill, and this is Homework Hotline. And remember, you can call us at 1-800-527-8839, or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. And now we're going to start something. We, we're going to finish something we started last. Okay, remember that we're here to answer your questions. Just call us, 1-800-527-8839, or simply dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. Now, by now, you know that Deborah is a Raider fan, so it's only natural for her to put Montana and Rice on the home team. Go, way to go, Deborah. Wishful thinking. Now, before I begin, as one of the original Homework Hotline teachers, I want to personally thank you, and I will personally thank you. I will somewhat paraphrase William Shakespeare and Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream. If on your screens we have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but labored here while televisions did appear. Dial this homework hotline theme so rewarding like a dream. Students, do but comprehend, and your homework we will mend. I, an honest TV puck, happy a hard-earned luck, now to scape the critic's tongue, we will answers make ere long, else TV puck a liar call. So, good grades unto you all, give us your calls, and if we be friends, and hotline shall restore amends. Now, who's on the line? Stephanie. Stephanie, what's your question, Stephanie? I was wondering how to um, write a limerick poem. Okay, so we're talking about a limerick. Yes. And a limerick is a fun type of poem. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to put one up on the board, and then we're going to, going to look at the structure and see how the poet did it. Okay, Steph? Okay. Okay. And it might be a good idea for you to write this down. It's not very long, just a few lines. It's called a tutor. That's the name of the limerick. And let's see if I can get it down. A tutor who tutored the flute. That's the first line. A tutor who tutored the flute tried to teach two young tutors To toot. Got to get that line in there. That's the second line. Tried to teach two young tutors to toot. Said the two to the tutor. Okay? And we have to put this in quotes now. Is it harder? Is it harder? to toot or, and they have this little or at the end, is it harder to toot or to tutor, to tutor, to tutors, and you have to be careful when you're saying this limerick that you don't have someone directly in front of you. <laughs> okay, to tutor, to tutors, Toot toot, my goodness. And of course, a question mark and the quotes. Now let's look at that carefully. 
a tutor who tutored the flute tried to teach two young tutors to toot. Said the two to the tutor, is it harder to toot or to tutor to tutors to toot? Okay, now let's see what that is. It's very funny, but there's a structure. Let's look at it. In poetry, we have, we have a rhythm. Every word has a rhythm. And in this particular poem, there are two rhythms. <clears throat> there's the light heavy. The, the unaccented syllable and the heavy accented syllable, that's called iambic. That's the rhythm. That's a poetic foot and that's the rhythm. Light heavy, light heavy. Then we also have in that poem light, light heavy. You add an extra syllable that's unaccented and that's anapestic. Now these are the two basic rhythms and you're going to have to do this in your limerick. So let's see how many of these poetic feet there are in the poem. We have a light accent here, a toot. And of course in the word tutor, we pronounce it tutor, the accent on the first syllable. So this becomes the heavy accent, a toot, and then a light accent, a light accent, a heavy one, and then a light. So in that first line, we have an I am, light heavy, and then we have a, a light, light heavy, which would be an anapest, and then we have a throwaway light syllable at the end. Oh no, I'm sorry, it continues. <laughs> I've crammed it in here, and it continues. Light, light, and then heavy. So in that first syllable, in that first line, we have an I am, followed by an anapest, followed by another anapest. And that consists simply of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight syllables. You've got to have eight syllables in that first line. The first one is the I am, and then you follow it with two anapests. Are you with me so far? Yes. Great. Now, let's look at the second line. Try to teach. We have light, light, heavy, and then two young tutors heavy and then light light heavy so that second line you have three anapes light light heavy tried to teach two young toot ers to toot so we have anapest 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 in that second line we have nine syllables and three anapes and that's the structure of it now it's going to change a little bit in this next line we have said the two. Two is heavy. So we have light, light, heavy, an anapest, and then light, light, heavy, and then we have this almost a throwaway last syllable, very light. So we have, we have an anapest here, light, light, heavy, an anapest here, and then we have this dying last, last syllable here, which is not a poetic foot, but the author puts it in for effect said the two to the toot or. And then the next line is a repetition of that rhythm. Is it hard, that's the heavy one, light, light, heavy, er to toot, light, light, heavy, and then that throwaway last uh, syllable, the or, okay? Which obviously is a repetition of the or here except we have two different words. That's what makes this limerick so clever. The author is playing off on the different words, the different sounds. Are you still with me, Stephanie? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, let's look at that last line now, because that last line brings it all together. Uh, two, and then a heavy one, to toot. So this would be an I am. Now we go back to the I am. The light heavy, and then light, light, heavy, or to toot, and then light, light, heavy. So we finish the same way we began. We finish with an I am, to toot, or to toot, ers to toot, with the heavy at the end. So we have the I am, an anapest, and an anapest. And that's the structure. So look at it two ways. You look at it with the number of syllables in the line. How many syllables in the line? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the first line. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in the second line. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the third line. And then a repetition, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the next one. And then it finishes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the last one. So you've got to have that structure. Now, what your subject is going to be, I don't know. But notice how the author plays with this. The author plays with this word, tutor. And of course, when you say tutor, that sounds very close to tutor, someone who's tooting a horn. And it also has, you have this two, you have this two, and then the author has this two. So it's a play on words all the way through it. And that's what makes it so effective. And then on top of all of that, the author has tremendous alliteration. Do you know what alliteration is, Stephanie? Uh, I don't think so. Yes, you do. Alli <laughs> alliteration is when the poet or the songwriter has the repetition of the initial sound in every word. In other words, look at this. You have a T here. You have a T here. You, and that's in the first line. Then you have the T inside of the word like that. So you have alliteration and you have consonants where the T sound is repeated. Then, of course, you have, look at this line, a T. Try to teach two young tutors to toot. Look at all those T's in there. So the author is making use of, all, of alliteration and consonants all the way through it. Now, Stephanie, what kind of a subject do you think you might like to write about? Um, like summer or something. So, like which? Summer. Or summer, okay. Now, what are some things about summer that you might, you might want to um, talk about some favorite things? What are some favorite things you like to do in the summer? Swim. Swim. Uh, what else? Go places. Okay. Now. Swimming might be a good one, because that's a good word. You notice how the author builds this limerick on the word tutor. Swimming might be a good word to build on. Are there some good things about swimming? Sure, right? Yes. Okay. Are there some things about swimming that, you know, might cause a problem? Yes. Uh, with, the, with the business of the sunburn that you have to be careful. With diving into a pool that... You, you don't quite know the depth of it, and boom, you're at the bottom after you dive right away. And uh, there are all kinds of things, so you have to think about some kind of a funny situation connected with swimming. Okay, Steph? Okay. Okay. You call back. I want to hear that limerick. Okay. All right, Stephanie. Thank you. Now, I had a call from, and let me see if I can do this quickly. I had a call from Celia a long time ago, Celia. In fact, she's probably grown up and married by now. And I've been trying to get this particular segment in because she was interested in signs and abbreviations. Signs and abbreviations. And of course, clever signs, clever abbreviation. And she wanted to know why are certain words in books printed in different types? I assume that she's talking about italics. So let's get right through it, and we'll go all the way through this business. Here are some common signs and abbreviations. We have CA period and C period. That stands for circa in Latin, and it means about. If you're not sure when something took place, you say circa. You put that in front. You have an FL. An, L, an FL like this with a period stands for fluoriette. It means that if you're not sure when a historical character flourished, when he had his best years, you put Floriet, for instance, 400 AD, and that would be King Arthur. Then you have the etc. that we're familiar with. That's two Latin words, etc. And it simply means, and the others of the same kind. Then you have these two signs, this kind of a weird S over here, and this kind of a funny E. Both of them stand for the and, and you'll see them very often in books. Then you have the et al with the period. It stands for et alii, simply meaning and the others. If you're making a list of names, the, the Dodger roster, you mention a couple and then you say et al. Then you have the ie. 
The IE stands for the Latin id est, and that, that's simply that is. If you want to rephrase something that, that you've said uh, or written, you say, you put down IE. Then, but don't confuse that with the EG. EG uh, is exempli gratia, which, which, is simply, which simply means for example. Uh, if you've mentioned something, and again, you want to pin it down, and you say, for example, EG. Then you have the common AD. The AD simply means Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. The CF, CF period here, stands for the Latin conferi, which simply means to compare. If you're writing something in a, in a paper, it's lovely to bring in other sources, other things. And so if you've just said something about Huckleberry Finn and you think of, of another character and another story, then you, then you would put the CF period and you would compare what Huck has done or what the situation is with another character or situation in another story. Then you have the Delhi. Delhi stands for delete, to take out. And then you have the stet, which means leave it alone. Don't, don't touch it. I want it to go the way it is. Then you have this one, the sick. And sick is always written this way. It's always in parentheses. And editors will use that. Newspaper editors will use it, uh, especially in the letters to the editor, where someone will write a word and it's misspelled. And the person who's putting the letter in wants you to know that this misspelling is not theirs. Not theirs at all. It's not their fault. They are simply quoting or writing it or spelling it the way the writer of the letter put it. So very often you will see that. That means, hey, folks, it's not my fault. I'm putting it down the way this writer put it down. Then you have the, this series of words, Mr., Mrs., Ms., Miss, Ms., and Messers. Let's get that Messers. Mr., of course, is the abbreviation originally for master. And then the word, the pronunciation was corrupted, and it became uh, Mr. Then you have Mrs., and we're going to miss the rest of this again. So th th this will make into a, a mini-series. Now, my time is up, but remember, Teachers and tutors are here, ready to answer your questions about math and English as we swing into our eighth year. So get to it. They'll be here until 6 p.m. and they'll be here Wednesday and Thursday. Later.